They've done studies of people who've mastered skills. trying to figure out why some people are simply very good at a particular skill and other people really master it. And they discover that one of the most important factors is that for the people who master the skill, it's something that has captured their imagination. They like to think about it. They like to try different ways of practicing the skill, try different ways of using the skill in unusual and unexpected ways. And thinking about the various steps that are involved in the skill captures their imagination, has them interested. And although we often don't think of imagination as being one of the factors to invo involve in meditation, in fact, we think that an meditation is anti-imagination. Actually, it's not the case. Because when we practice concentration, what are you doing? You're creating a state in the mind. The Noble Eightfold Path as a whole is something that's fabricated, something you put together. It brings you into the present, but when you get into the present, you discover how much input your intentions have in each present moment. In fact, the practice of the path is designed to make you more and more sensitive to that fact, to see how you put things together, how you put things together in such a way that can create suffering, or how you can get more skillful at it. So you can put things together in a way that creates less and less and less suffering, until finally you get to the point where the whole thing gets taken apart and there's no suffering. But to get to that last point, you have to understand what you're doing. You can't simply make up your mind that you're going to look at, be totally uninvolved in the present moment and just be a simple observer without participating. Because what happens is that your participation then goes underground. You don't see it, but it's still there. So instead, you have to be very open about the fact that you are shaping the present moment simply by what you focus on. That's a decision right there. And the way the sensations you focus on, the way you focus on them, is going to shape your experience of the present moment. You're creating a, what's called a state of becoming. The Pali word here is bhava. And although one of the things we're trying to learn how to overcome is just that. You can't simply drop the process. You have to understand the process before you can let go. Understand it to the point of dispassion, then you let go. And so to do that, you have to keep creating more and more and more of these states. But you have to create a certain type of state that's easy to take apart, easy to analyze, that's comfortable to stay with, which is why we practice concentration. Someone once asked a John Lee, when you're practicing concentration, aren't you creating these states of becoming in the mind? And the John Lee said, yes, that's precisely what we're doing. And then he went on to say, it's, you can't understand the process unless you keep doing it <coughs> until you can do it really well. He says, it's like, an, like having a hen that lays eggs. You keep creating these little things, and you get better and better and better at it. I don't know how much a hen gets better at it, but he says, in the meantime, you get some of them you take apart to understand how, what an egg is like. Others you eat, he says. The other part is because it gives you, an gives you something to take apart, puts the mind in a position where it can take these present states apart. So when you're conscious of that fact, look at the way you put the present moment together. You have choices, you know. Different things you can focus on, different ways you can focus. If you focus on the breath, you discover there are many different ways of conceiving the breath, your way of labeling the breath sensations. The way you decide when the in-breath is long enough, or when it's too long, when it's too short. A lot of these decisions get put on automatic pilot, but as you're meditating, you have a chance to examine them and adjust them to see if there are more skillful ways of deciding how long a good long breath is, how long a breath that would be just right would be. The same with the in-breaths, out-breaths, 
the depth, the rhythm, the texture of the breath. There's lots to play with here. And the word play is important, because you've got to enjoy the process. Otherwise, there's no enthusiasm for the meditation. You simply go through the motions because it's time to meditate. And when there's no joy in the process, and it's difficult to stick with it, the mind is going to lose interest, get bored, and try to find something else to think about, something else to fill up the hour. And what you do is you end up filling up the hour with other things that are not nearly as helpful for the reason we're here which is to see how the mind is creating unnecessary suffering for itself and to learn how to stop doing it. One helpful way of looking at the process is looking at the ways they've analyzed imagination. Psychologists have looked at the process of imagination discovered that it involves four skills. The first one is being able to generate an image in the mind, simply give rise to an image of one kind or another. The s second is to maintain the image. And once you can maintain it, then that gives you the opportunity to inspect it, to look at it in its details, to explore some of its ramifications. And then the fourth ability is to alter the image, make changes, and then you can inspect it again to see what happens as you alter the image. The psychologist who discovered these four, that imagination comes out of these, constitutes these four, is comprised of these four steps. We're doing with metal pictures in the mind, you'll discover that any kind of imaginary work, whether it's writing, developing a skill, involves these four steps. You look at compare the four steps to concentration, you find that they fit. The first thing is just to give rise to a nice, pleasant state here in the present moment. Can you do that? How do you give rise? What do you have to do? You can adjust the breath. You can adjust your focus. Breathe in such a way that gives rise to a nice feeling of at least one part of the body. And then the next step is to, once you've learned how to maintain that state, then to main, excuse me, once you've learned how to generate that state, is to maintain it, keep that nice state going. And you re re discover it requires mindfulness, alertness, steadiness to do that. Sometimes you find it's like surfing; the, the wave changes beneath you, but you learn to keep your balance. In other words, the knees of the body will change. When you first sit down, sometimes the body needs a fairly heavy rate of breathing in order to feel comfortable, but then as it feels more and more comfortable, the breath it needs will change. And so you have to learn how to ride that change in the wave. Adjust the rate of breathing so it's just right for the body, right now, right now, right now. And you get more and more sensitive to the fact that the body's needs change, but you can learn how to maintain a particular balance. As you get more and more sensitive to how you can respond to those needs, give the body the kind of breathing it wants. Of course, the body's not going to sit there saying, I want this, I want that, but you get more and more sensitive to the areas that seem to be starved of breath energy and can consciously breathe into them. The third step is inspection. You look at the state you have in the body, are there ways that you can Places where it's uncomfortable, places where it feels tense, where it feels tight, where you can change it. That's the fourth step. It's this third and fourth steps play off each other in this way. Once you change it, then you inspect it again to see if the change has made an improvement or if it's made things worse. If it's made things worse, we can try another change. Keep inspecting, keep adjusting. In Pali, this is called evaluation, with chara. And as things get more and more comfortable, you find that this range of comfort that you've been able to create for yourself gets larger and larger. 
So you can breathe in, and there's a sense that the breath energy in the body is connected in all its parts. You breathe out, it feels connected, and your awareness is filling the body, saturating the body. And then you find you get to a point where you really can't improve the breath anymore. It's just right as it is. So at that point you learn you don't have to make so many adjustments, so many changes. You should just be with the breathing. Then you begin to realize from this point on it's more a question of how the mind relates to the breath. Whether it feels that it's separate from the breath and watching it, or whether it's more immersed in the breathing. And as it gets more immersed in the breathing, how the rate of breathing is going to change, not so much because you've made up your mind to change it, but simply because you've changed your relationship to the breath and again more and more in a state of unification, a state of ease. All the way to the point where the breathing finally stops. Not because you forced it to stop, but because the mind is slow down enough to the point where it needs less and less and less oxygen. And the oxygen exchange at the skin is enough to keep the body going, so it doesn't have to keep pumping in and pumping out. At first there's a sense of a kind of exchange going on. John Lee has an image. It's like an ice cube with vapor coming off of it. The body feels very still. Around the edges there's a kind of vapor that you feel, the in and out breathing. And then after all, even that stops. Everything is perfectly still. All of this comes from creating that spot in the body where it feels good to stay focused. Then learning how to maintain that, then inspecting it to see where you could expand it, where you could make it more stable. And then adjusting it various ways, using your imagination to think at least of the possibility that the breath could be more comfortable, the breath could saturate the body. You can think of all the cells in the body being bathed by the breath. Whatever way of you have of conceiving the breath that makes it more and more comfortable, a better and better place to stay. So that the four stages of imagination apply to what you're doing right here. Even though it's not involved in the mental picture, sometimes there will be mental pictures behind it. But you're more and more concerned with the actual sensation of the breath as you feel it coming in, as you feel it going out. And as you play with it. To create a, a sense of very intense well-being right here. And even though it's something created, it's a good thing to create. As the Buddha said, right concentration is the heart of the path. The other factors are its requisites. And for discernment to do its work of insight in the present moment, you have to have a good solid basis. You have to create the basis through the concentration. So because it's a created state, you have to be creative about it, imaginative about it. And you find the more your imagination opens up to the possibilities, the more possibilities your imagination opens up. So as long as you're frank about the process that you're creating this state, you don't have to worry about getting attached to it. Because deep down inside you know it's something you've created, eventually you have to take it apart. But in the meantime, learn how to do it well. The more solid the concentration, the more you want to stay here. The more you want to stay here, the more familiar you get with the territory. And it's through that familiarity that the practice of concentration turns into the practice of insight. The kind of insight that can liberate you. Without this stability, the insight is simply the things you've heard from books, you've heard from Dharma talks, read in books, notions you've picked up from outside. And it doesn't seep deep into the mind because the mind hasn't softened up the territory here in the present moment. It's through the practice of concentration that the sort of the hardness in the present moment begins to soften up. And the insights have a chance to seep deeper and deeper. So 
when you have this kind of understanding about what you're doing, you find it a lot easier to do it. And you begin to realize it's not a mechanical process, it's a creative process. And that way it can capture imagination. And when it captures your imagination, you get more interested in what you can do with the breath. Not just while you're sitting here with your eyes closed, but any time of the day. Now the way you deal with the breath, how you get centered in the breath can help you deal with anger. How it makes you more sensitive to what anger does to the body. And you can breathe through the anger so it doesn't feel like it's taken over. When there's fear, okay, how do you use the breath to deal with fear? Get in touch with the physical side of the fear and breathe right through it. How it can deal with illness, how, how the breath helps you deal with pain. There's lots to explore here. And there's the possibilities of the breath capture imagination. You find that it's a skill that's useful not only when you're trying to sit with your eyes closed, but a very basic skill for dealing with present experience wherever the present may be, wherever you may be in the present. Whatever context, whatever situation you're in, you find that the breath has something to offer if you explore it. And to explore it, you have to get a sense that it can capture imagination. It gives you that kind of challenge, that kind of a sense of reward when you've explored something and discovered that you've learned something new, a valuable skill. And it's in this way that the meditation can start permeating your whole life. And when it permeates your whole life, you're more and more familiar with it. That's when the insights arise, unexpected insights many times. but valuable nonetheless.